Hello there. Welcome to the Saroid channel, wherever you are in the world, and so much love to each and every one of you. I do hope you're doing remarkably well. I'm doing great, thank you very much. And here we are on part two of our story, and what an interesting story this is, and I'm really enjoying it, and I hope you are too. So before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell, and the thumbs up. So let's continue with our story. The female officer nodded. Please go on, Mrs. Cladderstone, she encouraged. You were saying? Well, I was saying that I knew that Neville was smitten by my daughter. It was blindingly obvious. But after I bumped into his father in Walmart, I think I realised the level of how serious he was about her. I knew when I saw them together, Neville was looking at my daughter like she was Cinderella, if you know what I mean, putting her on a pedestal for sure. And that is a disaster waiting to happen, because no one can ever live up to those perfect expectations. My daughter's a very pretty girl, I said, thrusting my cell phone into the officer's hand, so that he could examine my daughter's picture more closely. The photograph easily showed off her long, honey blonde hair, her high cheekbones and very blue eyes that in certain lights almost looked like pools of turquoise. The male officer handed my cell phone to the female, who took a picture of the photograph with her own cell phone and then promptly returned my cell phone back to me. She's very pretty, she said, giving me an approving nod. I'm taking a copy of this photograph, if you don't mind, so everyone can be informed of what your daughter looks like. It'll be very helpful for us. As you can see from the photograph, officer, Myrtle's always had boys swooning all over her, like bees around a honey pot. It might actually be hard for you to believe, I said matter-of-factly, but I was rather like her at her age, had exactly the same problems myself. I warned her not to get serious about anyone at this stage of her life. But Myrtle's, because she's got all the time in the world, hasn't she? to enjoy herself before she finally settles down to be a mother and wife one day. Girls her age, officer, I do hate to say this to you, but they never, ever listen. They always stubbornly do what they want to do. In my learned experience, teenagers have minds all of their own. So when my daughter got involved with Neville, she went into the relationship with all guns blazing, you could say. What exactly does that mean, Mrs. Cladderstone? All guns blazing. It's an interesting terminology for you to use. Well, you know, like many young girls her age, my daughter was a little boy mad. They all are. She very much fancied Neville Myers. Had her eyes on him for a very long time, she did. I think teenagers, both girls and boys, are extremely visual. So when it comes to dating, someone's looks invariably play an intrinsic role, which of course is terribly shallow. But when you're young, looks seem to be so important. That's why these kids go ballistic on Instagram, flaunting themselves in front of the camera. I think the first time Neville took my daughter out, she was completely over the moon about him. And of course, her girlfriends were all green at the gills with envy. But after six months of dating him, with him becoming all serious and extremely intense towards her. I think the shine was beginning to wear off their relationship, officer. My daughter was becoming increasingly subdued and less excited about seeing the young man, which became profoundly noticeable to me, especially when she chose to stay in with me on a Friday night to watch movies and order pizza. She's never done something like that before. So the breakup in the relationship was a long time in coming, she told me she felt completely suffocated by the man. I had noticed that the police officers were beginning to exchange private glances between each other when I told them that I had boys flocking around me once. But it was true, I did. They probably found it impossible to believe that. But let's just say age had not been kind to me. I had myself to blame for that, of course. Back in my day, I'd lie back on the beach indiscriminately, lapping up the sun like a salamander and soaking myself in a tropical tanning oil that smelt of coconut to maximise the benefits of my tan. At the time, I had no way of knowing that I was setting up my skin for serious, irreparable sun damage. And if you had told me back then what I was doing to myself and how it would affect my long-term appearance in the future... I would have obstinately refused to listen to any well-meaning advice that you might have offered me. 
Why? Because I knew better, of course. Back in my day, I was interested in living in the moment. The future held very little concern or interest to me, as the future was such a long way off in the distance. It seemed like a lifetime away. Kids in my daughter's generation are a lot more savvy about that kind of thing now. Some kids are already taking precautionary measures to ward off the ageing process. Of course I acquired the perfect golden tan back in my day, which was the envy of so many of my girlfriends. It came at one hell of a cost, as premature ageing turned my perfect glowing complexion into a leather hide that would rival a rhinoceros. As a result, my youthful gloss was stolen from me, and by the time I was thirty, I looked as if I was in my late forties, and I don't say that at all proudly. I remember when someone asked me if I wanted a pensioner's discount at the store because it was Thursday and pensioners got discounts on Thursday. The teller tells me this, when at the time I was thirty-five years old. As you can imagine, I was utterly mortified. I went back home and cried my heart out, wondering why everybody thought I was so much older than my real biological age. I mean, the teller must have thought I was in my bloody seventies. My daughter Myrtle had come into the room to comfort me, and bless her cotton socks, she told me I didn't look a day over twenty-five. And although she was lying through her teeth to make me feel a lot better about myself, her kind reassuring words brought me a large measure of comfort, as Myrtle has always been a gentle soul like that. I couldn't have asked for a nicer, more considerate daughter, even though, of course, she did have that typical teenager propensity to a rebellious spirit. I expect my physical appearance also rapidly declined after my daughter's father, the quintessential love of my life, who I'd been married to for over eight years, was knocked over on a bicycle by a passing car, and was killed at the scene. I never did overcome or get over his untimely passing. I lost so much weight all over my body at the time, which I never regained, despite my very best efforts to do so. It would seem the pinched gaunt look never seemed to leave my face which only made me look significantly older. They do say if you've had a hard life, you can wear it on your face like another layer of clothing, and I expect that was true in my case. I never did remarry again, so it was me and my daughter against the world, and I liked it that way. Now here I was, sitting on the couch, with a cup of tea in my hand. More tea was spilling on my plush carpet than actually remained in my cup as my fingers were trembling so much with my shattered nerves all over the place, as I envisaged the dreadful prospect of a life spent without my daughter. The tea the officer presented me was so nauseatingly sweet, I was convinced that she must have tipped the whole sugar bowl into the cup. The two officers were asking me so many questions, many that I just couldn't answer. My mind was in such a dithering tiz. Could they not see I was in a dreadful state? For goodness sake! I'd had a horrible, horrible shock, and they were throwing questions at me like darts and a dartboard, with no end in sight. I wanted them to be out there, looking for my daughter's abductor, trying to find my daughter. What if she could never be found again? Why were they asking me all these questions? And what did my daughter's ex-boyfriend Neville have to do with anything? He was a nice enough chap. The police seemed interested in learning all about him. Why did they insist in looking in all the wrong places for their answers? As if reading my thoughts, the female officer said reassuringly, Don't worry, Mrs. Cladderstone. We've got some police already out there searching the woodgrove for your daughter, where you last saw the perpetrator when he took flight through the woods. In our experience, Mrs. Cladderstone, when an abduction like this happens, very often the person responsible may actually be known to the victim. Of course, this isn't always the case that the victim knows the perpetrator in a crime, but of course we need to pursue all options. We can't rule anything out. The fact that your daughter's boyfriend Neville was very possessive over your daughter, and his own father was talking about his wedding to your daughter one day, is sounding alarm bells to me. It could, of course, be extremely innocent, but that is what we're going to have to find out. Your daughter broke up with Neville a week ago, and now she goes missing. The two may not be connected, but at the Sheriff's County office we don't take coincidences lightly. I'm in no doubt it's going to have been very hard on Neville Mayers that your daughter broke up with him when he was so serious about her. We need to question him at the earliest opportunity. In order for us to connect the dots, Mrs. Cladderstone, we do have to ask questions. I know it's annoying. 
but it does help us build a picture of what may have happened to your daughter and if she may have known her abductor or not. Do you think, Mrs. Cladderstone, that Neville could be behind your daughter's abduction in any way? Of course Neville's not behind my daughter's abduction, officer. Honestly, the idea is absolutely ludicrous. You're both barking up the wrong tree there. You've got the wrong impression of Neville. And you forget that I did actually witness the person that whisked my daughter away on his shoulders. And it certainly was not Neville that I saw. Neville may be many things, officers, but he'd never abduct my daughter, I can assure you of that. He was in love with her, you know. You wouldn't do something like that to someone you loved, would you? Even if they broke your heart. You'd be surprised, Mrs. Cladderstone, very, very surprised. I'm afraid to say that love can make people do strange, idiosyncratic things. We see it all the time, especially if the love is of the obsessive kind. Many crimes we see are connected to obsessed love, or financial gain, of course. I never said that Neville was obsessive, officer. You misunderstood me there. I said he was possessive. There is a difference, I imagine. So did your daughter, Mrs. Cladderstone, tell you how Neville Mayers reacted to the breakup? It's very important. Can you remember exactly what she told you? I noticed the female officer was asking me all the questions, while the male officer, who was older and more senior, listened very quietly in the background, while nibbling the back of his pen, and casting me curious glances. Perhaps he thought it was better for his female colleague to ask me all the questions, because they are of, were of a sensitive nature. Maybe he thought she would be more gentle towards me. I frowned. Not really, officer. My daughter and I are very close. But she doesn't like to talk to me very freely about her love life. She's always been private about the affairs of the heart. She simply told me she broke up with Neville. He didn't take it terribly well. But she told him she couldn't get too serious at this stage of her life. That's all I know, officer. I know my daughter very well, officer. She would have been very tactful about the way she broke up with Neville. She'd have done it very gently. I'm quite sure he would have had nothing to do with any of this. He wouldn't want to harm a hair on my daughter's head. That's a maybe, Mrs. Cladderstone. But we have to rule out all options. If we didn't, we wouldn't be doing our jobs properly. Now I want you to tell me everything that happened the morning when you saw your daughter being abducted by this young man. I told you, officer, I can barely remember anything at all. It happened so fast, like a twinkling of an eye. It was like watching a dragonfly flying across the water. One minute it's there, then it's gone. You make a very good point, Mrs. Cladderstone, said the male officer, suddenly injecting himself into the conversation. Things, I imagine, went terribly quickly. They always do. But try and tell us what you do remember. I reluctantly put my teacup down on the coffee table. I had enjoyed holding the cup because it kept my hands lovely and warm. Well, me and my daughter, officer, have been coming to the cabin that was left to me by my grandparents in their will at every available opportunity. I did think, of course, of selling the place or even renting it out to weekenders, but I couldn't bring myself to doing it because I'm very attached to the place. It was my idea for us to come to Seal Cove Cabin for the weekend. My daughter was terribly keen. She even invited her friend Tally a girlfriend of hers, to come along with us, who unfortunately had to cancel at the very last moment. It was a dreadful pity, of course, as my daughter would thoroughly have enjoyed being with Tally. They've been besties since my daughter was knee-high to a grasshopper, you know. She literally lives three houses away from us on our street in Seattle. I genuinely believe that had Tally been here, the two of them would have been together. So that abductor would never have abducted my daughter, because there would have been two of them. Why did Tally cancel spending the weekend with your daughter? The male officer inquired. Well, a corner of her tooth came out, would you believe it, at the dinner table the previous night. As a consequence, she was having very insufferable toothache. She booked into an emergency dentist. She was desperately upset that she couldn't come. She's been to Seals Cove on a plethora of occasions. Loves this place to death. It's like a second home from home to her, you could say. I see, said the officer. 
I'll need you to give me her details so I can speak to her. She might have an insight into your daughter's private life, given she is Myrtle's best friends, and best friends tend to know things. Go on, Mrs. Cladderstone. You were talking about what happened when you arrived here for the weekend. Well, we had a lovely time here, as we always do. Settled in very quickly. Yesterday went by without a single hitch. It was a perfectly lovely day. Me and my daughter went on the canal on her motorboat. We both thoroughly enjoyed the sunshine, watching the seagulls, and of course the seals. We enjoyed a barbecue outside our cabin later that night. It was spectacular. We made s'mores and chatted a little about everything and nothing as you do. My daughter was in a very happy place, you know. She almost looked as if the weight of the world had been lifted off her shoulders. She seemed heartily relieved to have broken up with Neville Mayers and was texting some of her girlfriends, who were very surprised the relationship was over, she told me. So you did not see anyone around and about your cabin the previous day or after you arrived here? asked the male officer again. Or anyone, for that matter, behaving a little suspiciously and looking out of place, perhaps? Absolutely not. When I come to think of it, the cabin was very quiet and has been like that since we arrived here. It was just me and my daughter, the seals and the girls. I didn't notice any activity from the other two cabins close to ours, which was rather odd, because those cabins are usually occupied by guests over the weekends. The owners let them out as weekend retreats, you see. They usually get very booked up. So no, I didn't see anyone around, which was, as I said, rather unusual. Myrtle even commented on how quiet it was. We weren't complaining one bit, of course. It was good to have the place entirely to ourselves. I wasn't going to complain about that. So what happened before your daughter was abducted, Mrs. Cladderstone? Think very carefully. What did you do that morning, from the moment you got up? Well, we both had breakfast like we always do. I made my daughter blueberry pancakes with maple syrup just the way she likes it, served with turkey bacon. My daughter doesn't eat any red meat, you see. My daughter told me that after breakfast she was going to take a motorboat out onto the water. She asked me to join her, but I told her I wanted to relax and read a book, and I'd come out with her later that afternoon. She loves being on the canal on that motorboat of hers, watching the seals diving into the water from their rocky islands. She can watch them for ages, you know. She absolutely adores seals. As you know, the water around here is warmer than in other parts of the Pacific Northwest, so it's very pleasing to be out there on the water. When people are staying in those cabins, it's not unusual for me to see a stranger at the water's edge, sometimes getting into a boat with crab baskets which they drop into the water with markers to retrieve later, when they hope to haul in a catch of crabs, if you know what I mean. My daughter's done that before, of course, but she's such a softy. She always lets the crabs go in the end. She doesn't want to ever eat them. When it comes to crabs, she examines her catch, takes a great deal of pleasure in releasing them back into the canal. It was probably about an hour ago, but I'd been in the kitchen preparing some tea. Iced tea, that is as it was pleasantly warm outside like it still is now. And when I came out onto the deck of the wraparound porch, I observed my daughter Myrtle on the beach next to the canal, talking very nonchalantly to the young man. Now I'd never seen him before a day in my life. I immediately thought someone must be staying in one of the cabins. Maybe they'd just moved in, and they were having a nice chat with my daughter. I saw nothing sinister in their conversation. I could only see the young man's back view, of course. I didn't get a close-up view of him. My daughter and this young man both appeared to be laughing at the seagulls, who were masterfully dropping mussel shells from a great height onto the rocks, so they would break open, and the gals naturally swoop down to the rocks to gobble up the contents. I don't think the young man had ever seen that before, which made me wonder if he was local or not, because he seemed very impressed by the seagulls. Let's not kid, the birds of the Pacific Northwest are remarkably clever. As you can imagine, I wasn't exactly paying close attention to my daughter. I was distracted by the book I was reading. I'd got to a very exciting part, you see. I thought my daughter would have been out on the boat, but the stranger had stopped to talk to her. I thought he was simply asking her about where was the best place to get oysters or something like that. 
You often get people staying in the cabins, asking us for some advice. I had settled down very comfortably on my wicker basket chair to read the book and to enjoy the sunshine that was now streaming onto the deck. And I was bathing in it hungrily, like you do, because I've always loved the sun. I'm sure you can see it by my complexion. I have got a thick rhino hide. Well, that was when I heard a scream. At first I thought it was another one of those annoying loud seagulls, making a raucous commotion as they so often do. Possibly fighting over scraps. You know, the sort of thing. Those seagulls can half scream, let me tell you. But then you probably know that only too well, given that you both live in these parts. The male officer smiled. Yes, I know about the gals and their screams. Go on, Mrs. Claddiston. You're doing very, very well. You've been very insightful so far. Well, it was something about the scream that made me look up from my book and take a second look. If I hadn't done so, officer, I can assure you I would have never seen what had happened to my daughter. So I'm glad I saw her in that pivotal moment. If I had not done so, I would be dreaming all kinds of alternative, weird and equally horrifying scenarios as to what could have happened to her. I realised it was my daughter who was screaming. So your daughter was screaming, Mrs. Gladstone. We've established that. You bet she was screaming, officer. There are not words to describe how I felt at that moment. I became paralysed, as if my entire body had frozen up with fear. Because as a mother, officer, hearing your daughter scream in terror like that is not a sound you would ever wish to hear. I would have changed places with my girl in a heartbeat. I couldn't believe what I was seeing with my naked eye. It was like something out of a horror movie. And happening here in broad daylight, of all things, under my very nose. Well, the mind boggles, does it not? Whoever the young man was, officer, he was brazen to do what he did in the middle of the day. He must have been reasonably confident that he wouldn't have been seen. Maybe he knew that the other two cabins weren't occupied this weekend, Mrs. Gladstone. That would make him extremely confident. That's what I think, officer. Now, the man that Myrtle was talking to, he seemed nice enough. I mean, they'd been laughing together as if they were old friends. Well, I never expected anything untoward like this to happen to her, did I? If the truth be told, I was actually rather glad to see my daughter's smile, given how upset she was feeling after having broken up with Neville. My daughter can't bear to hurt a soul, so it made me smile to see her having a good laugh. I remember thinking to myself, I'm so glad I brought her to the cabin for the weekend. Isn't that a joke, officer? I wish I could have seen through a looking glass, because we'd never have come here if I'd known what was about to happen. This man must have been reasonably strong, Mrs. Cladderstone, to run away with your daughter on his back like that. Not really, officer. Of course he was a strapping man. Looked like he worked out every day in the gym had very big biceps and that kind of thing. But you must remember my Myrtle is about 90 pounds. She's a skinny thing. Takes after me, she does. It's a genetic thing, you could say. Most people in our family line are predisposed to being rather thin. The young man threw poor Myrtle over his shoulders and ran into the woods. There is a road on the other side of the woods, officer. That is one of those sequestered off-the-beaten-track roads. I'm sure the man had a car of some kind, a vehicle parked out there, as it wouldn't be easily seen, and he probably squirreled my daughter away in it without being seen. Oh, the thought just makes me want to just crumble up and die. It really does. I just can't bear to think of it. He could be long gone by now. I'm pretty sure that's what happened. Otherwise, why did he run through the woods like that? He was making his way to that back country road. It can be the only thing he was planning to do. I threw my hands over my mouth and stared at the officer with pleading eyes, almost begging for him to say something that would give me a smidgen of hope. And then I said what I'd been dreading to articulate, but the words tumbled out of my mouth before I had any chance to control them. The abductor's going to rape and kill my daughter. Isn't that right, officer? That's how these things tend to pan out, is it not? I asked him. Looking him straight in the eyes, I saw him flinch and glance away from me as quickly as he could, so that his eyes were now fixed on the hardwood floor, because he avoided my gaze, and in doing so, 
He told me everything I needed to know, and affirmed my most dreadful fears. We hope it won't come to that, ma'am, he said uncomfortably, shifting awkwardly in his seat. This time it was the female officer who took charge of this rather awkward situation. She encouragingly leant forward and gave my hand a tight squeeze. Mrs. Cladderstone, I'm not going to sugarcoat things for you. That wouldn't be a kind thing to do. I'm not going to give you any false hope. I have to warn you that abduction cases are never easy. We don't know how this case is going to end with your daughter. But we are going to do our best to search for her. Do our utmost to find her, so we can bring her home to you safe and well. The officer's words made my heart plummet through my chest, as a feeling of great foreboding consumed me. I knew that the outcome of this situation might never be good. During the course of the morning, another policewoman was recruited to stay by my side, almost as if I was a child that needed minding, when all I really wanted to do was to be out there with the search parties looking for my beloved daughter. This woman kept plying me with endless cups of sickening sweet tea and telling me over and over again that it would be all right. At one point I rudely snapped at her and said, I know you mean well, but I would appreciate it if you had stopped saying everything is going to be all right. Don't you get it? Nothing will ever be all right again. My daughter has gone missing, and the chances of her coming back safe and well are very, very slim. With that, the woman thankfully shut up. It was from the vantage point of the wraparound porch that overlooked the canal and the distant grove of trees that I sat with the officer at my side, soberly watching many police people and volunteers combing the woods to search for my girl. Just when all hope had run dry, like the last remaining droplet of oil left in the bottle in order to make that life-sustaining bread, there Myrtle was, almost as if she hadn't disappeared at all. Almost as if she'd come back from a hiking adventure, looking slightly dishevelled and a little worse for wear, with leafy foliage tangled up in her long blonde hair. Seeing her was the most beautiful sight I'd ever seen in my entire life. I gasped at that moment and said, It's my girl! It's my girl! It's Myrtle! And from the wraparound porch, I quickly took flight down the steps, running towards Myrtle, as if my very life depended on it. I was like a supercharged rocket in takeoff. Myrtle was covered in a silver sheet, providing for her thermal warmth, even though there wasn't even a nip in the air. But all that mattered was that she was alive and well, and she'd come back safely to Seal's Cove. I practically threw myself into my daughter's arms. Unrestrained tears of great joy spilled down my cheeks, and for a moment Myrtle looked right through me, with a vacant expression on her face as if she didn't know me at all. She seemed bewildered, confused and disorientated, as if she was a goldfish that had been thrown out of her bowl. Good news, ma'am. As you can see, we found your daughter. She is safe and well. A bit scratched up she is, as you can see, but no worse for wear, said the male officer, grinning from ear to ear, as if he made a habit of finding missing people, and this was another day on the beat for him, so to speak. She'll be fine, I'm sure. Your daughter's a bit confused, I'm afraid, Mrs. Cladderstone. It does appear she doesn't remember what happened to her, even where or who she is at the moment. But that is quite common with people who've had a shock of some kind. They do tend to suffer from bouts of amnesia. I assure you it's all perfectly normal. Nothing to worry about. It's almost as if she's caught up in some kind of trance. But it'll soon wear off. We will bring her to the station for questioning at a later date, to uncover if she has any recollection of what actually happened to her. But she's been checked over by a medic and by the forensic specialist, and it seems apart from a few scratches on her body, she has not been assaulted or even raped, which is very good news. That torturous event had happened three long weeks ago, and it might as well have been a thousand light years ago. To all intents and purposes... After we returned home to Seattle, I had not been able to leave the house at all. My irrational fears had plagued me, rendering me almost housebound, and the house I had called home had almost become like a birdcage to me, in which I now found myself trapped. Yet I was the one putting myself in this precarious position, shrinking away with fear from the world. What kind of a mother was I? Goodness gracious me! My daughter was the one that had been abducted, 
and yet I was the one crawling away into my shell, afraid to breathe in the light of the day, lest it should actually burn me. I needed to get a grip or my reaction to what had befallen my daughter would be my greatest undoing. It was when I made this decision to rise up out of my comfort zone, like a phoenix from the ashes, that I forced myself to take a walk around our leafy green suburban neighbourhood in Seattle. My therapist had recommended I do this. Believe me, on my part it took great courage, but it was the very best thing I could do for myself, because no one can put you back on the horse if you fall off it. You need to get back on the horse on your own. Sometimes you have to face your fears and do it anyway, otherwise things can get way too out of hand. I had heard of people who were so afraid to leave their homes for years and years on end, for they had become crippled by their fear. I couldn't allow myself to become one of these people. My daughter was naturally very concerned about me, because she'd never seen her own mother reduced to a bag of nerves like this. Mum, I wish you wouldn't put all this stress on yourself. It's quite unnecessary. It's like you're afraid of your own shadow. Since I was abducted, you've become affrighted by almost everything. You've got nothing to worry about. I'm not going anywhere, am I? Everything turned out all right in the end. Even though I was abducted, the guy never laid a finger on me. I'm home safe and well. Isn't that what matters? That's a maybe, Myrtle. But what you fail to realise is what it's like to be a mother who loves your daughter more than anything else in the world. And can you imagine what I went through over those eight excruciating hours when I thought I'd lost you forever? It might as well have been eight long years. It was too awful for words. So there we are. That is the end of part two. Part three is tomorrow night. I look forward to you joining me then. Until next time, goodbye and good night.